It's been called by some investors the ultimate ratio. So what is return on equity all about and does it deserve those kinds of plaudits? Well, who thinks this is a fantastic ratio, whatever it is, and we'll look at it in a moment. Amongst others, legendary investor Warren Buffett, chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. The primary test of managerial economic performance, the primary test, he once said, is the achievement of a high earnings rate on equity capital employed. More about exactly what he means there in a moment, but return on equity is the primary test. Crikey, that's quite an accolade. More concise, this is the mother of all ratios. It's one way it's been described in the Financial Times lexicon. All right, I'll try and hint at why that might be in a moment. And thirdly, uh, another source of praise for the ratio, legendary Japanese investor, uh, Wai Takeda, a tycoon and private investor in Japan, one of the most successful ever by some accounts. The good picks, he said recently, are those with low ROE now and a plan to boost it. ROE, return on equity. So it's got some fans, whatever this thing is. So let's have a look at how it works, the pros and cons, and decide whether it is indeed the ultimate ratio. So the logic, <clears throat> very important question for investors, no doubt about it. Key question, some would say the key question, is this, what return am I earning on my capital? That's true whether you open a bank account, stick your money in there, buy an IOU, a corporate or government bond, put your money in there, what return am I getting? It's the key question for any investment. If you're gonna set up a business, what return am I getting? So whatever this ratio is, it's clearly answering a pretty vital question for investors. Return on equity is basically saying, is this firm any good at turning assets into profit and at what rate? And basically a firm should be able to generate an ROE that you're comfortable with. Now, comfort factors will vary from investor to investor, but remember if you're buying shares, you're taking a lot more risk than someone who just puts the same money in a bank account or puts the same money into government IOUs, all right? So what we're saying here is that ROE should be consistently higher than a bank account, higher than a, a government IOU, or why take the risk? As to how high, well, we'll look at that towards the end of the video, but that's the key question. Am I getting a, a hurdle rate? Am I hitting a return that I'm comfortable with as someone putting my capital to work in this particular way? Now, what is it? Bare bones. You'll normally get this quoted at you, so I'm not gonna go through this in massive detail. Essentially, you take profit after tax for one year, all right? Uh, usually the latest year you've got available, and compare it to shareholders' equity. A little bit more about where you find those numbers in a moment, but in truth, most of you will probably never have to actually bolt this together. That is return on equity. Now, like any of these investment ratios, as they're called, uh, basically what you need to be doing, uh, and by the way, you can turn that very quickly into a percentage by just doing that kind of thing times 100%. So if you're not comfortable with the answer, you know, 0.05, multiplying by 100, return it into 5%. So for argument's sake, if that was 100 million, for argument's sake, one year's profit after tax, shareholders' equity was, let's say, uh, 500 million, more about where you get these numbers in a moment, times 100%. I mean, some people would say, well, I'm comfortable with the idea that that's, you know, 0.2, okay, 100 over 500, but, but most people prefer to work in percentages, so times 100% would give you 20%. Okay, so there's your, your basic mechanics. Now, if you were to try and bolt this together, not many people will want to, you would go hunting uh, in a couple of places. Before we go there, just to mention that shareholders' equity can be calculated a few ways. So it's always worth asking the question, how's this been done? You can use opening shareholders' equity at the start of the year, if you like. Closing at the end of the year will take an average of the two. But that's just to point out that if you see two ROE figures that don't agree, it might be the way they've been calculated that's the explanation, not someone having made a mistake. That, unfortunately, is true of most ratios. Now, if you were going to put this together, you would need a profit and loss account. You would track all the way down to the bottom pick up the profit after tax figure, the amounts are less important than the basic principle. You would then head into the balance sheet. Now I do videos on profit and loss accounts and balance sheets elsewhere, so this is gonna be brief. Having got your profit after tax figure, this is return on equity, so you've got the return, but what's the equity? You would then go into the balance sheet and normally pick up the bit that belongs to shareholders. So you'd want the figure there, there's your sort of total invested shareholder equity, right? And there are variations on this theme. 
We're looking at return on equity. Some people prefer to look at return on total capital employed, in which case, just for information, you would tend to use your profit before interest, here called financing costs, and on the bottom, you tend to want to use your shareholders' equity plus long-term interest-bearing debt. That's just a side note. So do ask the question, am I looking at return on equity, is what we're focusing on here, or am I looking at return on total capital employed? Now, let's assume someone's crunched the numbers and come out with that 20%, which sounds quite good. What does it tell you? Right? It's a simple way for an equity to compare returns. Uh, basically, 20% sounds pretty good. I mean, what does a bank account pay you at the moment? Uh, you know, 1% maybe. What does a government IOU, uh, IOU offer? Well, a 10-year you know, Spanish bond at the time this video was shot, 2.6% for argument. So 20 is sounding pretty impressive. Were you able to find it? So high ROE firms are good at generating shareholder returns. They can take their assets and turn them into profit. Good might reveal competitive advantage. So if 20 compares favorably to a sector average of 12, maybe you really are onto something here. It's a good way of testing the quality of other measures. Earnings per share, for example, gets quoted very heavily. But around the time this video was shot, um, analyst and uh, Fundsmith manager Terry Smith pointed out that whilst you know, for about 12 to 15 years, Tesco's earnings per share figure had been rising, return on equity had been kind of falling off a cliff. So for some people, it's the way of testing the reliability of other numbers, published numbers like earnings per share, for example. It's a starting point for DuPont analysis. Just a quick word on that in a moment. It's a very useful way of beginning to go down and drill down into the company's results. And it can be used in combination with other ratios. Now, these last two points are taking us a little bit beyond basic level. So I'm going to keep these fairly brief. And in future videos, we can explore them in a bit more detail. DuPont analysis, this is why it's called the mother of all ratios, in a nutshell, because you can, don't worry about the mechanics here, this is just a beginner's video, you can take return on equity, your 20% for argument's sake, and actually strip it down into the firm's ability to generate a profit margin per item times the speed with which assets are turned over times leverage or gearing. All right, now I'm not going to go into that in any more detail here, but one of the reasons it's called you know, the king or the mother of all ratios is that ability to break it down and start to really get to grips with how the business is generating that 20%. You know, is it profit per item? Is it asset turnover? Is it leverage or gearing boosting returns, something I cover in other videos, or is it a mixture of all three? All right. Now, what was my point about on the previous slide can be used in combination. Well, here's another way this ratio can be used. Just to give you a few ideas. Combining ratios, there are people who'd say, right, what I could do is I could look at something called the price to book ratio, covered elsewhere, and this thing, return on equity. Now, there is a kind of holy grail here. There's something you're looking for, all right, on this grid. So there are four possibilities. High price to book ratio, low ROE, like high price to book, high ROE, and so on. What are we looking at here? What we're saying is if a firm has a high price to book ratio, it's expensive. So maybe we don't really want to be looking at those firms. It's a very simple analysis. All right, because in the top right-hand corner, you're getting that 20%, but you're paying for it, high price to book. Over on the left-hand side, you're paying for low levels of performance. Well, who wants to do that? We're looking for cheap stocks, looking for bargains. So do we want to go hunting down here? Low price to book, low return on equity? Probably not, because you're getting what you pay for. It's cheap for a reason. So maybe, maybe happy days are in that box right there. All right, there, low price to book, cheap. High, or more likely rising ROE, where hey, you're getting in on a climbing act at the bottom. All right? Just a flavour for how ratios can be combined. Do more on that in future videos if there's demand for it. Now, to wrap up, weaknesses. Is this the ultimate ratio? It's looking pretty good so far. I'm just kind of selling it to you, but be careful. It doesn't tell you much about efficiency. It's all very well saying this firm generates a return on equity of 20%, but what if it can only raise funds at 21%? You don't know that from return on equity. You need to understand the cost of capital as well as the return. Yeah? You know, high return at a high cost of capital may be not such a good deal. It doesn't tell you much about cash. So we're generating 20%, but when does that turn into cash? When does that become dividends? Hard to say. It's skewed by debt. 
okay, which reduces the need for equity. So all I'm suggesting is that it, sort of, it can mask, to some extent, firms' gearing or leverage levels. Capital events can boost it. Share buybacks there. There's another video on share buybacks from me out there. But basically, if you reduce the capital, the equity capital of a firm, by buying back shares, you may boost return on equity. Actually, nothing's changed in operational terms. So watch out for that one. It's backward looking, unfortunately, because I just said you take the 12 months you've got nearest available to you. It can be inflated by people who choose to exclude intangibles, because there are purists out there who say they want the return just on the tangible asset base of the business. Well, that's all very well, but it makes it difficult sometimes to cross-compare firms that do have high levels of intangible assets. And as I've shown you earlier on, there's disagreement about how to do it. Do I use opening equity, closing equity, and average? You need to ask the question, how's it been done? So given all those weaknesses, and I've gone through them at some speed here, all right, we need to just make a couple of notes at the end about how useful this ratio really is. And this is where you know, things can go wrong. IBM's average ROE over that period was around 70%, depending on how you calculate it. Take out the effect of share buybacks, because it was a consistent buyer back of shares. It was shrinking the equity in its balance sheet, if you like, more like 13%. So you get the idea. Pre-credit crisis, many banks were saying, our ROIE is consistently 15% or more. To which Martin Wolf responded, well, if that's really true, one day you'll be almost the whole universe. You, know, you can't compound in real terms 15% for long. All right? So just be aware that you know, companies make claims about ROE that may be a little bit realistic, need to be tested, and it can be influenced heavily by decisions about things like share buybacks. So I do like it. It answers a crucial question. What return am I getting on my capital? Am I doing better than the bank? Am I doing better than other shares in the sector? Am I doing better than the market average? But it's not the ultimate ratio by itself. And there's one reason for that. No ratio is the ultimate ratio all by itself.